my name is Alison Cole and I work at the Open Society Justice Initiative. I'm here today to introduce a theme to you that will continue over the next few speakers, looking at the use, use of technology for truth-seeking. So um, I myself am not a techie, but I've been engaging in your community for the last couple of years, and I've noticed there's actually quite a few different professional sectors that are pulling into this question of how can we utilise facts in a way that can get to the truth in the heart of the matter. So in this context, um, we have to recognise we're actually working in quite a vulnerable and sensitive space. We all know that. We have a, a, a heightened duty of care to ensure that when we're entering into the work environments we're at, we're maintaining the first principle of do no harm. And to do that, we really need to collaborate and work together and understand some of the key dynamics that may be similar or different for the different professional sectors that are working in this common space of using technology for truth-finding purposes. So there are some common aspects um, on one hand. We are generally looking at the documentation question. How can we find out and document the facts that we're seeing? And on the other hand, how can we deal with uh, other people's documentation steps? How, we, how can we verify what we've seen? And then with those two components, how can we analyze to have a, a story or narrative behind uh, the fact pattern that we're witnessing? Um, Within that, we of course have infrastructure challenges um, that are similar and security challenges that are similar. However, there are aspects that are not similar. Um, to give one example, if you look at the question of source protection, on one hand, journalists might want to have technology which is essentially protecting in a complete opaque way their original sources, where lawyers, on the other hand, might actually need the exact opposite. They need to be able to ultimately disclose at the end of the proceedings the exact identity of their sources to the defence as required under fair trial rules. So I should, um, at this point, make um, a disclosure. I myself am a lawyer. Um, this is the logo of the International Criminal Court, where I used to work. So I've worked at a range of different uh, criminal UN criminal courts, all of them, actually, and I'm really inspired by your work because I can see so many uh, points of entry that could really maximise the evidence gathering that we're doing. And in fact, everything that everyone's doing in this room has the potential to be evidence. So I wanted to share perhaps some of the legal frameworks that could help um, explain what the judges, uh, the tests and the questions the judges will apply to your material. So first up, the judges will ask, is this relevant to the legal proceedings? So um, really relevancy is a content-driven question um, and content will have to be determined by the substance of the law itself. The substance is pretty complicated. This is just a um, chart showing the framework of the substance of international criminal law. And at the Justice Initiative where I work over 2015, we're developing an app which will help make this content more accessible and user-friendly because some things aren't so intuitive about the content of the law which will assist uh, determinations of relevancy. Uh, for example, linkage, who is responsible, how can we document um, things like uniform or communication systems or try to otherwise intuitively assess in a factual dynamic uh, who is the leader of that um, incident. The second question judges will apply is, is this material reliable? So reliable in a legal context is essentially the question of authentication. Authentication within itself um, is essentially trying to determine, is this piece of technology is this information, an accurate representation of what it purports to be depicting. So again, there's another layer of tests. We lawyers, we love our tests, um, which help determine what is uh, authentic. And the first test here is the question of the chain of custody. How can we demonstrate from the point of creation, the first use of the technology through to when it comes into the courtroom, that this material has been within the custody of the person who can vouch for its veracity? Uh, again, there's another three steps that are applied um, in making these assessments, particularly in um, the context of video evidence. Judges will look at how original this uh, video is, they'll look at the integrity within um, the production of that material, and they'll also look at the date and time that the video was created. This is just a, a quick list of um, some other components that the judges will feed into those three tests, three points tests, um, really trying to get at, you know, is there a hidden bias or is there some other uh, purpose behind um, the creation of this material. And finally, the judges are going to ask the question, like, what were your analytics? What was your an analysis method? What databases were used? Um, how was big data assessed in this component? And really, this is where we need some guidance on expertise, because at the end of the day, you're speaking to judges. I literally had a 30-minute a conversation with a judge about YouTube, and at the end I was asked, but what are you putting in the tube? So overall, <laughs> we need to make this accessible. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>